broadcast. This is going to be on Daystar and various other channels. And uh, what we're talking about is the year is going to be a year of growth and grace. Well, I believe this year is going to be the year in which you're positioning yourself for the next, dare I say, the decade of battles to come. The kingdom of heaven is advancing. This year, you're going to be positioned further in the authority of God's divine call and purpose in your life than you've ever been before if you advance right now in the battle. And that's why I'm giving special uh, teaching, special training. It's called the uh, Mount Zion Mantle, and you are authorized. Two special products that we're combining together and making available to you. Go to lancewallet.com forward slash open door if you're listening to this on a podcast. Uh, or call 1-800-910-6349. Write down that number. They'll pray with you, and they'll make sure that you get this stuff, you know, to your address and get, get what you need. But I want you to uh, grab a hold of the Mount Zion mantle. Why? Because we're going to talk about how to go up. And the way to go up is you go down. You go down, in a sense, in humility, in order to go up in promotion. It's like an upside-down kingdom. And almost... All stories in the Bible, whether it's, like I said, Abraham, called to be the father of many, he's given a vision, A, and he's expecting his wife to get pregnant, so B, he can go into fulfillment with the joy of having a baby, little Isaac. What happens? He ends up going into not a pregnant wife, but a woman who gets older and older and older, and he finds finds Ishmael, he comes up with an innovation to fulfill God's calling. But it's a fleshly, carnal solution, not God's solution. And God puts him in the contradiction of having a barren womb with a supernatural deliverance. God causes him to have strength when he's an old man uh, in order to get his wife pregnant and his wife's strength to conceive. And here's grandma pregnant. Think about it. Supernatural birth. So the process is there's a, a vision Death of a vision, supernatural fulfillment. David is anointed to be king. David doesn't go into the throne after Goliath and then go into reigning over 12 tribes. David goes into hiding in the wilderness being chased by Saul. For a decade, he's running for his life. He is enduring the contradiction. And while the contradiction is happening... He is actually in the spirit realm moving on this track. But his emotional state is down here. His circumstances are down here. He's writing his lamentations in his Psalms. Oh God, why are you so far from my groaning? And then at the the very zenith of his, his attack, he's at Ziklag. He comes back with his men at the moment of transition. And his wives and his children and the property and all of his 300 guys, is, they've all lost everything. A collapse, a great depression has taken over their business. The enemy has stolen, and they want to kill David. But David, the Bible says, encourages himself in the Lord. He had to put on the anointing. He had to do what you do, which is put on Christ. He had to draw on the anointing. He had to draw on the resources of not letting himself go into a tailspin, crash and burn. He had to grab himself and say, the Lord has been faithful to me in every battle I've ever had. In every moment like this, the Lord has delivered me. The prophecies of Samuel are still upon me. I am seeking you with all my heart. Oh, God, be not far from my groaning. Uh, may God triumph over my enemies. Boom, God takes him from there into supernatural deliverance. He recovers everything he lost. And while that's happening, Saul is taken out of the picture. Little did David know, his biggest test, where he had to draw on inward resources, was going to be the test Saul had to face, where Saul did not do that, and Saul was taken out. I want you to think about this pattern. Vision, death of a vision, supernatural fulfillment of vision. Because the vision isn't isn't false. Your problem and my problem is the pathway there. And I'm telling you that the, part, the growth part is putting on Christ. It's putting on the fruit of the Spirit. 
Gerald Durstein, years ago, was a great minister, taught me so much. I'm going to be going down to Gerald Durstein's Christian retreat. I went there on my honeymoon. See how fanatical I am? Annabelle and I went to Gerald Durstein's Christian retreat for my honeymoon. They have a thing called Missionary Island. I was going to go to Missionary Island, actually. I wanted to go, I wanted to go learn how to be a missionary. And uh, while we were there, the Lord, the Lord ministered to us many things. Gerald taught me something. He taught me that Christ in you is not only the hope of glory, but Christ in you is who you minister to others. When, when you're around someone who's distressed, let the peace of Christ come through you. When you're around somebody that is um, down, let the joy of the Lord come forth from you. I'm not saying this is ordinary. This is extraordinary. But it's possible. And Gerald talked about first you have to learn how to minister to your own soul. You have to be like David. You have to encourage yourself in the Lord. You have to say when you're anxious, why are you anxious, oh my soul? Put on Christ. And the number one way you can put on Christ, I showed you in our last broadcast, is in the place of worship. See, it's not just like sing song service before the preacher preaches at church and you like the uh, music and you like the selection. Oh, I like the voice of the singer. That is so carnal. The only voice you need to worry about is yours and you don't even need to be a good singer. You just have to be able to make a joyful noise. God wants to hear your voice. Your spirit man wants to hear coming out of your mouth. Oh God, you're great. Oh God, you're good. Oh God, you're mighty and triumphant. And I have peace like a river. I have peace like a river. I have peace like a river in my soul. And suddenly your mind, your will, your emotions starts to come under the sway of the anointing. You tap the rock and the waters gush out. And the indwelling power of the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, comes over your mind and God gives you peace that passes understanding. And then you realize the words of Jesus, let not your heart be troubled, let not your heart be afraid. You are in control of what state you get into and the world will try to hook you and the demons will try to hook you and who knows you maybe got to get delivered from stuff and something's working in your head and it'll try to pull you but when you take authority over it by accessing the indwelling power of the holy spirit peace i leave with you not as the world gives give i unto you let not your heart be troubled my joy i give to you not as the world gives i give you my joy that your joy may be stable constant and full. This is how we're going to go up through the open door in 2024. It's this teaching of survive 24. I could, I could say that you're going to finally arrive in 25. You're going to be in a place where you can control the, um, the internal atmosphere so that you're not subject to being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and every stimulus that comes into the environment. Wouldn't that be wonderful? When you could cut the cords of manipulating strings and no longer be a puppet, but actually a free person walking in the Holy Ghost. Let's go take a look at this. When David was called, he was called by the Spirit of God to do something. I want to segue into an important concept here. The Mount Zion mantle is about going up, going up. You're authorized to bring forth supernatural fruit. You're called to go up. David was ahead of his time. He saw the future. He saw a place where worship uh, and, uh, and the tabernacle of David uh, the ark of God and the presence of God was going to be accessible. And we, we, we sometimes don't get the fact that David was a king who had a tabernacle of open access for the presence of God. He could go before God's presence. Do you know that David took 400% more real estate than Saul? Saul also was called to be king. Saul had 40 years. David had 40 years. Both of them had 40 years. One had 400% more success. Why? Well, they both had the same assignment. It's very important you get this. There's no 
power of favor, supernatural favor. The attraction of God to you that releases an influence through you so that other people are inclined to cooperate with you in the assignment God gave you. Favor is the most strong when it's on an assignment, not on a person. Ordinary favor will get you a, you know, a blessing at the restaurant, a parking spot in a busy mall. <laughs> That's for most people. I pray for favor and they pray they find a parking spot. The real force of favor is on a governmental assignment. When God gives you a job and when you're walking in that, doors open and things happen. David stepped into an assignment and that was the reason why he could say, a thousand will fall at my side and 10,000 at my left hand, even though Moses is attributed. If you technically read the text, you'll see Moses wrote these words, but they're considered the Psalm 91. It's the Psalm of David. Because David was in battle and thousands fell. Moses wasn't in battle all the time. He was on a hill praying. Joshua was the guy who fought. David says, I, I claim this. Thousand fall to this side. A thousand doesn't come nigh me. Why? Because I'm dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. What was the secret place? He was dwelling in the center of the will of God and the anointing of the assignment that he was fulfilling. What was the assignment? What's the assignment on your life? What's the, what was the assignment on David's life? Why don't you go to 1 Samuel? That's where you find out about David and Saul. 1 Samuel, got your Bible? Why don't you have a Bible? Lazy Christians sit down and wait for PowerPoints. You need to be able to find these things in your Bible. Get a pen, mark them up. I mark up my Bible. You know why? I like knowing when the footprints of Jesus come into the garden, I want to know where he walked, what tree he went to, and what he talked about. I underline what the Holy Ghost tells me. That's why I am a good teacher, because I'm a good student. So, here you got your, uh, your, your first Samuel. Now, when you go to first Samuel uh, chapter uh, 10, you'll see something interesting. You'll see uh, Samuel takes a flask of oil... There's your anointing. He puts the oil on the head of Saul and kisses him. There's favor and the anointing and a kiss from God. And a promotion. Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? How many of you would like to have an increase in anointing? I do, Brother Lance. How many of you would like to have an increase in authority over devils and circumstances? Oh, I would, Brother Lance. All right. The authority, the favor, the anointing over God's inheritance, having responsibility for something important to God? Oh, count me in, Lord. What was his assignment? Go to chapter 9, verse 16. You'll see the assignment that gave him the favor, that gave him the anointing, that gave him the authority, that gave him kingship. Tomorrow, about this time, the Lord says to the prophet, I'm going to send you a man from the land of Benjamin. You're going to anoint him commander over my people. There it is, the oil of anointing. He's going to be a commander over my people. I'm going to back him up. Why, Lord? That he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines. Underline that. Saul had one job. Save my people. You're never anointed so that you can have a jet and a car and prosper and, and you could you have a TV show and everybody go sign up for your mailing list. You're anointed for a particular assignment and you better find out what that assignment is. And this year you need to know what's my assignment, oh God, because that's where God gives you the commanded blessing. And Saul's assignment was to save God's people from the hand of the Philistines, for I've looked upon my people. Their intercessory cry and groan has come up before me. I believe God is raising up deliverers in America and in the nations because the intercessors are crying for God to do something. And when God answers a prayer, he sends a man or he sends a woman with the anointing. God sends a vessel. He doesn't reach down and say, get out of my way, I'll do it. He raises up a Moses, he raises up an Elijah, he raises up a Joseph, he raises up a Nehemiah, he raises up an Esther, he raises up a Saul or a David. A David, if Saul doesn't do the assignment. So he has one job, 
save the people from the Philistines. Saul forgets that. You know what he thought his assignment was? To be the king over Israel. Oh, that's a profound statement. If you think your job is your identity, your calling, your office, and your ministry, you have missed the point. Your identity, calling, office, ministry, anointing, and authority is for the purpose of a divine assignment, and to each of us has work given to us. Jesus said, to everyone his work. Your job is not my job. I'm in Texas. If I was in a different part of the world, I'd be fighting a different battle. But I'm in the United States. I'm in this city. Your geography, your nation, your time in history, many factors go in to shape the assignment you have. Well, anyway, Saul had an assignment, and he failed it, and David picked up the assignment. And so... uh, So much power in these words. Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate. He wanted to meet the seer. And uh, he didn't have any idea that he's having a divine appointment with the seer at the gate because God is going to meet at the gate. Those are where the gates are. The gates of consequence. The gates, the door in 24. The prophetic is going to meet you at the gate and give you your assignment. Are you listening to me? I'm going to talk to this camera. Now watch this. Samuel kisses him, anoints him, chapter 10, verse 1. And he starts to tell him, after you departed from me, certain things are going to happen. You're going to have a divine sequence of events that's going to overtake you. Random, seemingly, uh, your your appointments are going to be set up by God. And you're going to run into some people that are going to do this, they're going to do that. But here's the main thing. Um, Verse 5, after that, after you meet certain people, that are going to give you bread and wine. It's a symbol of communion, incidentally. After that, you shall come to the hill of God. Kim Clement taught me this. You're going to come to the hill that belongs to God. And on top of it is a stronghold of hell. You're going to go to the hill of God, and on it is a garrison of the Philistines. You're going to go to the hill of God, and on top of it is a Philistine garrison. What do you, what's his assignment? Save my people from the hands of the Philistines. What in the world is a stronghold from hell doing on top of God's hill? Well, a group of prophets was coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument and a tambourine, a flute and a harp before them, and they were prophesying. And when that happened, the Spirit of the Lord is going to come upon you, Saul, and you're going to prophesy, and when the prophetic anointing comes upon you in proximity to the assignment where the stronghold of hell is where it should not be, and you're going to take down that stronghold, that's when you're going to be transformed into a different man. The anointing will change you. It'll bring the new creature in Christ to the surface. It'll it'll bring the new man on the inside of you to the surface. And so it was when he had turned his back from Samuel that God gave Saul another heart and all those signs came to pass and they came there to the hill and there was indeed a group of prophets that met him and the Spirit of God did come upon him and he prophesied among them. He got under the spirit of prophecy. And the Lord said to him through Samuel, once you have a change of heart, once you have the anointing and you're released to that assignment, you don't have to have a blueprint and wake up every day. Oh, Lord, what do I do? What do I do? Do as occasion requires. Use your own judgment. I'm with you. I'm behind you. Do the best you can. Make your own decisions. I'll back you up. Don't be looking over your shoulder. Just do the best you can as occasion serves. And whatever you're doing, I'll cause the blessing factor to come upon it and you'll have success. Wow. Woo! Is that a wild promise? Now, I just want to say that Saul fell out of his assignment, but David got in. How did David make it? No, oh, of course, he screwed up with Bathsheba. Oddly enough, He only failed after he wasn't fighting the Philistines. See, his assignment 
was to deal with the Philistines. And when the time comes that kings go forth to war, instead of David doing what his assignment was, he came under the power of overwhelming sexual temptation because he wasn't in the warfare that God called him to. You see, sometimes when you're not in warfare, you expose yourself to the devil's temptation. It isn't the warfare that was dangerous for David. It was Bathsheba's bath routine. <laughs> At the time when kings go forth to war, David wasn't with him. He, you know, he forgot his assignment. He was distracted. I believe this year we got to save America. I haven't been told we're going to save it, but I've been told this is the assignment. And I'm willing to embrace every contradiction that comes my way. And if the news cycle is against me, as, as look at Trump, they're threatening $300 million, they're going to fine him, going to shut him down from having businesses in New York. We got teachers teaching, don't get involved with politics, don't get involved, oh, you know, Christian nationalism, and, ooh. and, uh, and, and, and uh, you've got insane prophetic tangents going over here, you know, saying stuff that isn't, doesn't happen and confusing to people. Folks, you got to be able to stay in the, what I call the plumb line anointing, like Zerubbabel. Stay right there, rightly divide the word. Stay in the Holy Ghost. Stay in your assignment. Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. And uh, the Spirit of God is going to give you unusual success. I'm talking about the Mount Zion mantle here. I got to go over here. I got to go over here and show you something. Back over here to the teaching. In terms of our Mount Zion mantle, Lord spoke to me and said, don't let your frustration with the circumstances and the events ever be stronger than your delight in my word. Don't let your agitation, as it were, with things that are unfolding, pull you off the wall and out of the spirit realm. And when that happens, worship, pray, stay back in close, bridge the gap into close communion with God. You ever wonder what the praying hands is all about? See, when you're here, there's a gap. You're over here freaking out, and God's over here calling you. But then you come together like that, and the connection in worship, the connection in communion, the connection in meditation, the connection in be still and know that I am God. You see, and you let the Spirit of the Lord come upon you. You ought to do something Oral Roberts taught me. I went to Oral Roberts University. I remember him teaching that before he did his great healing and supernatural signs of one of his crusades. Backstage, for years, he did this. He'd take his hands over his head like that, and he would say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he literally would fold like he was a bigger man. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he put his faith out there for the Spirit of the Lord to be upon him. I remember how I was getting picked on by a certain... Uh, leftist organizations mocking me because I said that you need to have a point of contact sometimes to release your faith. But I remember Catherine Kuhlman had this carpet and she'd uh, be praying and walking back and forth backstage, oh God, oh God, crying out because she needed, she needed to have the Holy Spirit show up. The people had expectations of miracles. I mean, it's great to be a preacher or a teacher. People want to come just hear Billy Graham. All you got to do is, it's not all you got to do, but you preach and have an altar call. But, but when you got a miracle ministry, people are coming, they want to get out of wheelchairs. A little bit, little bit different pressure on you for manifestation than coming to hear great teaching. So she'd be dying a thousand deaths backstage all the time. Oh, God, you know, empty, emptying herself out, doing a ritual in a sense of putting herself into a place of complete fusion with the third person of the Trinity. And then you'd see her kind of mincing. She, she'd come real fast. Do, 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 do. And I watched her a couple of times. I went to her miracle service. And she'd run out till she got center stage. Well, there was a carpet up there. And she had this, this mental statement in her head that the moment she hit that carpet, she was in the zone of the miracle service. And she would race to get to that point. And in a sense, her faith was there to meet God and God to meet her in that area. So, I'm in front of the whiteboard for a reason. In the Mount Zion mantle, wherever you're at this year, God wants to take you up higher. And then, once you've uh, stabilized there, he wants to take you up higher. And what we find out is that Hebron was the place where David was anointed the first time. Uh, actually, Hebron was the place where David was anointed the second time. 
The first time David is anointed by Samuel in the midst of his brethren. And David is over here getting the anointing with all of his family around. And Samuel anoints David the first time and he's supernaturally anointed. Then we find David in this place called Hebron and something, uh, something interesting happens. David is there hiding out from Saul. Hebron is the word for the place of fellowship. And you could say David is developing his relationship with his core workers. And he's also building his place of covenant with God. He's strengthening himself in the Lord for his promotion. Now what happens is he's already been anointed by God, but the tribe of Judah comes and the tribe of Judah then anoints David as king. We'll put a crown there. They anoint David as king. And the Bible says that they anointed him. Now, he didn't get a supernatural anointing from Judah. What he got was authorization. Because someone has to be in agreement with you for you to be able to do something for them. Jesus could not do many mighty works in Nazareth because they didn't believe on him. But authorization comes through recognition. And what the force of favor wants to do is cause somebody to recognize what you've got. And it's painful when you got it and it's not recognized because then people, you know, they got all kinds of things they say about you. All hat and no cattle is a saying we have in Texas. That somebody's got a real big hat and doesn't have a lot of, to deliver. And, they'll, and you've got it, but it hasn't been released yet. Many times, people that are called to lead are, are serving on staff under other people. Joshua's wandered around the wilderness for 40 years. He was called to lead, but he had to be obedient and wander around and bury people for 40 years. Second anointing was Judah. Once they anointed him, then all 12 tribes came, all 12, all of them came, and they, the Bible says, anointed David king. Third anointing, they anointed him king. Now he has full recognition. Can I say this to you? The first anointing is God's ability. The second anointing is partial recognition. The third anointing is full recognition. Once in Hebron, David got the full recognition. He was able to take them to Jerusalem. And they were able to go take the city of David. And they were able to establish Mount Zion. This would be the place where the tabernacle of David would go. This would be where the government and the glory of God, this was the secret to the 400% increase that he had. First anointing, second anointing, third anointing, one from Hebron, the other to Jerusalem, the other one to Mount Zion. The Mount Zion mantle will show you how to move into those three anointings, those three phases of favor, those three seasons of promotion you want to go to lancewilla.com forward slash open door, call 1-800-910-6349, and it's my joy to be able to help you navigate your way up the mountain and through the contradiction, and don't lose your mind or wig out, but put on Christ and let the peace of God keep you at every step. I look forward to seeing you again in our next broadcast. God bless. Did you enjoy this latest episode? Please remember to share it with your friends, because the more knowledge you have, the better equipped you are to navigate the world.